Hi, welcome to our virtual event, A Sound Body and Mind, Finding Your Center, hosted by Make It Better. I'm Mimi Toll, Editor-at-Large editor from Wren Magazine, which is part of Make It Better Media Group. Today, we're excited to bring you an array of experts on the topic of wellness for your mind and body. They will share their advice ranging from topics like the importance of meditating and what it's like to be an Olympic athlete. Your goal is to glean some useful tips that you can bring back to your life. Our guests include Mar Sora Peru, Partner and Chief Wellness Officer at Beyond, Suzanne Miglioli, President of the San Francisco Zen Center, Christine Walsh, the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Foundation President, and four-time Olympic athlete Kara Winger. Some housekeeping notes before we begin. Please send panelists uh, questions in the chat box. This is a fundraiser for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Foundation. There will be a link. A link will be placed to donate in the chat towards the end of the event. Um, speaking of the end of the event, stay on um, to meet the panelists in a breakout session, an extended Q&A. What you'll do is you'll go back to the home page where you can click on a booth and you have to scroll down, scroll down, select a table, and then you'll have a Q&A with the panelists. All right. Um, let's get going. First, I'm going to introduce Mar Sora Peru. She is partner and chief wellness officer at Beyond, a luxury private club with a foundation in wellness. Mara is a life coach, yoga instructor, and holistic wellness consultant. And of late, she leads the Beyond team um, of wellness professionals to design hyper-individualized wellness plans and develop nutritious smoothies and supplements for their club. Mara has worked with individuals across the globe through her empowerment life coaching program, which follows a three-step approach to life mindset mastery, habit formation, and thoughtful action. As a certified yoga instructor, Mara has been a highly sought after instructor by top rated studios and has worked with both private and corporate clients over the years, bringing a powerful message with her work. Her education began with a degree at UCLA, and then she spent some time in finance with Nuveen Investments and Guggenheim Partners. But her true calling is wellness, and she continued her education with various degrees in life coaching. Mar's background coalesces with her authentic excitement to enrich the lives of those around her and making her influence integral and beyond as a community and brand. She is currently living in Chicago with her husband and two children, including a newborn baby. Hmm. Mar? Thank you so much, Mimi. And hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, I'm really excited about this. I think the topic is something that I'm quite passionate about speaking on. Um, and I want to kind of go back to when this was brought to me, uh, to my attention about this event, and when it was said it's about finding your center. And it's, it's a conversation I have often with a lot of individuals about how do I get back to balance? How do I find balance? But more importantly, how do I live a more vital, enriching life? And maybe a life that's more impactful than the one I feel I'm living now. I'll say that that's a question that I get asked often. And the one thing that I always try to remind everybody is that we are constantly evolving. We are constantly recalibrating. And it's always about finding those fundamental pieces of what supports you from a physical, emotional, mental, social, spiritual space. So to back up, um, in November 2020, I opened uh, Beyond here in Chicago with my three partners and two other partners. Um, and we opened on the day before we had opening day slated for the day that Chicago shut down for the pandemic. And we sat in a circle and we talked about, do we open? What do we do here? We have a full staff. We have a membership rate waiting to, to join us and walk into these doors. We've been building the space um, and the concept since 2018. And we decided that right now was never gonna be more of an important time to support our membership, but also the community at large. And I say this story because Beyond is not only in Chicago, which is the heart of the nation, but our membership makes up a bunch of individuals from a diverse array of backgrounds and experiences that come to us to live a more vital existence. So our club is foundationally built on holistic health and social well-being. 
in one space, which we call our ecosystem and our sanctuary, we house everything from a full concierge medical program, uh, a full fo food and beverage pro program. We have a nap room. We have modalities such as cryotherapy, cold plunge. We have a full fitness center with personal training, a gym that's fully equipped, uh, chiropractic and rehab, a beauty side, nutrition, naturopathy, Eastern medicine, energy healing, Ayurveda, mental health, all of these elements coming together to support our members. And with those members, they then radiate out to their communities, their families, and that's where change happens. That's where recentering and balance occurs as a global entity, is it starts with one person. And that's how we see our club and that's how we see serving our members. So when it comes to finding that balance, I'll say at Beyond, we have a process that when you join, there is an advisor that is there to meet you exactly where you are, to understand what's bringing you into membership, but what is, what's on your mind? What is your challenge? Um, where are you personally, you know, as of late, how has the pandemic affected your life? And how can we support you to equip you with the skills, with all of those areas that I mentioned that are housed at our club? What route can we create together to draw a roadmap to help you build the skills to live a vital existence every day? So we see ourselves almost as a place to skill build. And it's a, it's a very com strong community. We've now been open a little over a year. And it's been kind of a wrap up of my life's passions and my backgrounds all into one place. And I guess a personal side of finding my center is I got pregnant two months after starting the concept of Beyond in 2018. And I just had my second child uh, almost three months ago in one week. And I'll say that the concept of balance has never been more kind of personal to me is how do I figure this out? How do I, how do I balance all of these different things? And I've often found myself over the past couple of years, really thinking about what is it that are my fundamentals that keep me going in a positive way, mentally, um, physically, all of those things that contribute. And I'll say that it's a very personalized, customized approach to figuring out what works for you. So I know for me, a nice long yoga class was something that was going to be a treat. And now I get my little, I call dosing and I do my dose of 10 minutes of yoga. Maybe it's one minute of meditation. But the point here is that I choose for that to be enough. And that's something I really emphasize is that it's all about choice making. It's about making choices with integrity. It's about watching how you focus on things and what you choose to focus on is, is how you feel and how you feel then determines the quality of your life. So for me, it was a complete turnaround of, I'm going to decide that this one minute is going to be one of the most important minutes to set me up for success today. I want to be the mother I want to be. I want to be the leader I want to be. And I want to show up for the membership and for clients of mine with my, the most open heart and the best energy that I possibly can. So it really, I like to talk about this with individuals because what is your makeup? What is it that you're making choices on that are moving the needle for you in a positive way? And then what are the things that you see as hurdles and how do we then knock down hurdles based on taking more ownership over your health and wellness? And these conversations at the club, we've had multiple what we call transformational stories, individuals coming in for membership for an array of reasons, someone going through extreme loss, and needing to grieve and wanting to allow for the pieces to come back together um, a little more, I guess, with more peace and more ease and trying to rebuild stronger than before. We have individuals coming with weight issues and wanting to lose, you know, the 10 pounds upwards of 80 pounds. We have individuals coming who are complete wellness lovers and they've gone all over the world to all of the best spas and the best ashrams in the world. An ashram is where you're silent for a while and you eat the most amazing diet and you leave there feeling like an amazing person. But the point is, is then you come home and you're bombarded with life stressors. 
So we have individuals coming to us with all of these different backgrounds, just wanting to feel better, wanting to understand how they can get back to their balance, which again, I say, how do we continuously recalibrate when you're finding yourself slipping out of balance or away from where you really want to be? So one of my favorite stories is um, a woman who I worked with personally quite a bit over the past year. She wanted to lose upwards of 50 pounds was her goal. Um, she wanted to start moving again. She had a pretty traumatic experience within the last couple of years. And she pretty much felt that she was at a rock bottom place and wanted to rebuild um, and put the pieces back together. So through yoga, through breath work, through nutritional coaching that we do, we completely allowed for her to make the changes in her life that she now has found extreme success from uh, losing over 75 pounds. And she's now complete yogi, re doing reformer Pilates, feeling the best. And we can see this in the results with her own personal relationships and with her business itself. So it all really comes together and makes an incredible difference when you are really focused and you also have a team. And I'll hit the point of the team too, because at Beyond, we are all connected. So never in one space has all of these different providers and essentially these different, um, different uh, industries all come together. So for me, I do play a role as an advisor. I have access to a certain member's personal training coach. I have access to their um, acupuncturist, to their concierge medical provider, who then also is speaking with F&B, the food and beverage program, to support all of the choices she can make in the club. So we're all speaking about how we can help her on a very deep level. And this occurs often with individuals that are coming into our club to do multiple different things. And that is how we really find that we're supporting people on a very customized level and a very deep level because it is a hundred percent, not a one size fits all. This is all about where are you? Where have you been? And where do you want to go? And now let's think about based on your time limitations, your life, what, what you have going on, how do we make this puzzle fit together? And it's something that always does come together, but it requires an open mind and having creativity by your side. And I'll further emphasize just the idea of finding your center being a choice. Sometimes, and this is an important point, you may not feel in balance and that's okay. You may not feel the best ever and that's okay. You may not even feel happy sometimes and that's okay too because part of the human experience is to experience all of the array of emotions and then what's the most important thing is what you do with them. So what you do with feeling certain things is how you can then start to rebuild whatever needs to be rebuilt or whatever actions need to be taken in order to feel the best that you possibly can. And then you support your families, your businesses, your neighbors, and the society overall. And I can't emphasize more how important it is as one individual, how much that radiates out and makes a difference. Um. So awesome. that's what I have. That's great. That's well, I really loved how you talked about dosing, like the thought that you could just do yoga for 10 minutes as opposed to committing to an hour and then you're never going to do the hour. So, um, yeah, I, that's a huge one because it's a, it's a hurdle for yeah. people, you know, one minute of breath work and I'm sure Sozan is going to be able to talk about this, you know, one minute of anything, if it's intentional and you're choosing to make this, you know, a very focused minute whatever it is, it makes a difference. And again, yeah. it's all about what you're choosing. We have a, one of our audience members is a member with you. I just, she wrote something really nice. Uh, Jennifer wrote this lovely place helps me stop, pause and feel all caps, my values. The breath helps me slow down caps, which probably is emphasized mm -hmm. and listen to my heart. So that's, that's really sweet. Um, it's nice to hear. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Okay, so next we have Suzanne Miglioli, um, who's originally from Argentina. He began his Zen practice in 2007 
and received his precepts in the Dish, uh, Dishimaru lineage. I actually had to look this up. A precepts is that is a type of ethical training, and I'm sure he'll explain that. Um, he graduated in business administration, Buenos Aires, in 1995 and worked in marketing for international corporations before founding his advertising company in 1999 with offices in Buenos Aires, Barcelona, and Mexico City. As I was reading that, Suzanne, I thought, what a fun life. That sounds awesome. Um, and he first discovered San Francisco Zen Center in 2013 during his honeymoon. And in 2014, did his first practice period at the city center. And then the next year, after living in Japan for six months, he and his wife, Paula, became residents at the San Francisco Zen Center. Um, he then lived at the Tassajara Mountain Montessori. After completing three practice periods, he then received his priest ordina ordination in the Suzuki Roshi lineage of, in 2017. So he's very accomplished. And he is now the president of the San Francisco Zen Center. Back to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi, very much for, for that introduction. And I'm very honored to be to be here, very happy to be, be part of this panel, especially because a sound body and mind is what kind of motivates me to do what I do as, as a Zen priest in the San Francisco Zen Center. A sound body and mind is what brought me here. Um, and for those who don't know the San Francisco Zen Center, Actually, this year it's, gonna, it's its 60th anniversary. So it was founded 60 years ago. It's um, the oldest Zen training monastery in the, in the US. Um, and it was founded by Shunryu Suzuki, a Japanese Zen master that came um, to San Francisco um, in, in the 50s. And he actually came here to cater uh, to the Japanese um, uh, society or, 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 or people around um, uh, what we call now Japan town here in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, but then it started growing and started growing. And from that place in Buchanan Street, um, then it, it, it expanded to what it's today. And today we uh, have three temples, the city center at San Francisco, San Francisco, um, it's called Beginner's Mind Temple. Um, and then Tassajara, which is a mountain monastery in Big Sur, and Green Gulch Farm in Marin. So these are the three temples that uh, today host around 160 residential students, which is quite quite unique in, in the West. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm talking about meditation and the kind of the topic here is meditation without expectations, but I'm really talking about meditation because meditation is a pillar of Zen. You know, we, poor word, right? Zen is, has been used for soaps or, you know, so many different things. Um, but really when, when we're talking about Zen practice, which is a Buddhist practice that was born in China, then went to Japan and now to the West, um, Really, meditation, as I say, it's 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 a pillar. It's really really important. And you know, as you know, Zen or meditation has been around for for many many years. And thousands, I would I would say. And and why is this this is important, right? Why why finding that center, finding that um, stillness in meditation is is important. We're going to talk about that a bit. A bit today. Um, as many things, when you want to start something, there is a what you want to do and a how you're going to do it and a why, and maybe linked to a for what you're going to do what you're going to do. And of course, this is also true for, for meditation. In the, in the short time that we have today, I'm not going to go too much towards the what and how of meditation, no, um, but more to the why and for what you meditate. Of course, there's a different answer for, for everyone, right? So I don't want to, I want to assume that everybody has the, the same or the same idea of, of why, uh, why you would meditate. Um, but mostly, mostly, 
people think of meditation as um, a way of being maybe relaxed or calm or for some people to be enlightened and good luck with that so so we have a desired outcome right when we start meditating that there is like a plan there's a why there's a for what and i want to be super clear about this desires and plans are totally okay they're they're fine there's nothing wrong with having a, a why a for what in, in life and, and even in meditation but this why or for what actually um, what we could call the outcome, your expectation, is really what causes the challenges with, with meditation. And, you know, I, I see many people coming to, to Zen Center, um, well, not so much now with, with COVID, but um, <clears throat> going through the front door and saying, yes, I'm here to be, to get relaxed or, you know, um, and, and to be um, fulfilled somehow and balanced. And then they start meditating and, and, and you see how they're struggling and say, well, this is hard. Say, yeah, this, 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 can, this can be hard, but what is it that makes it um, particularly hard? And this is why I wanna go back to the expectations, go back to the, um, to the why, to the for what. Because having expectations during meditation, wondering if the thoughts that come and go are meaningful, or if you're going to be more relaxed, or if things, you know, it kind of introduces an, an effort, you know, and, and, a, and a mindset. And puts a mind at a superficial level, a gaining mind, a state of a gaining mind. And it's usually never the way you imagined, right? What happens is usually never the way you imagined to be. And, and this, this is a, a drawback. This, this, this makes people feel um, maybe that they're doing something wrong or that they're not good at it or so many things that come up with this gaining mind in meditation. So, of course, things can and will happen during meditation. What we are saying here, and this is kind of a key component in Zen training and Zen meditation, is to release your expectations of a specific outcome before you start meditating, right? This is, some people will enter meditation with the hope that they will be able to you know, manifest something or, um, and this can be anything from total bliss to some special insight or complete relaxation. High expectations of a specific outcome will probably lead to disappointment when they do not arise or manifest immediately or if they don't manifest at all. Um, so the less expectations you have in your meditation, the easier you will find it to actually find that center to, to meditate. There is this um, amazing phrase that I like from uh, Pema Chodron, who you might have read some books uh, or, or know. Um, she says, if it weren't for my mind, my meditation would be excellent. Um, couldn't agree more with, with Pema there. If it weren't for my mind, my meditation would be excellent. So when you when you decide to meditate and, you know, as Mar said, it, it can be for 10 minutes, it can be for 20, for 40, whatever time you decide to meditate. The, the thing here is not to approach this meditation with a mindset of fulfillment or something will happen. And this is what I want for it to happen. As um, Suzuki Roshi, the founder of San Francisco Zen Center, used to say, when you meditate, you leave your front and door, your front door and your back door open in your mind. And you let your thoughts go through. Just don't invite them for tea. And that's kind of what, what's going on here, right? Because there's no best or right kind of experience in meditation. 
we, we, we tend to label everything. You know, we finish the meditation, we say, oh, this was a really good meditation. Oh, this was really not that good. Um, or yeah, I, I got distracted or my mind doesn't stop. All this just um, adds to the experience of meditation in a way that in a way that's not wholesome, in a way that doesn't really, really work. So what I'm saying here is, can you enter meditation with curiosity instead of expectations? Can you enter meditation with, as we say, beginner's mind, the mind of a beginner? Every single meditation, even years after meditating, we are always going towards that, towards just sitting. And actually, there's a Japanese word for this is shikantaza, which means just sitting. When you sit in meditation or lie down or whatever kind of meditation you, you're doing that moment, you enter meditation with a curious beginner's mind. Be present in the moment. And you don't invite the judge into your meditation. And, and even after the meditation. Once you end your period of meditation, you just say, okay, you let it go. Whatever happens, happens. Things happen way beyond your conscious mind. And that's usually what we judge, right? What happened, you know, how do you feel? How does, just, just let it go. Meditation without expectations. You don't have them at the beginning of the meditation. You are present, you are there for it, fully present. And then you let it go without judging, keeping that curious mind. And that will probably bring you back, probably bring you back. And, and this is important or the important thing, coming back. So if you can meditate without expectations, it really changes the way you meditate. And I think that's all the time I have. So there might be some questions after. Yeah, so Zan, that, that was great. I, amazing pearls of wisdom there on meditating, something that I keep trying. So we'll get more questions to you um, after everybody's spoken. So next up, we have Christine Walsh, who has served as the Chief Development Officer in the United States Olympic and Paralympic Community Committee. And, um, at, and the President of the U.S., she is presently the President of the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Foundation since March 2019. Her interest uh, in Olympic Games starting when she earned a master's degree in sports organization management, which was a program sponsored by the International Olympic Committee. She graduated top of her class, received an award for her thesis, which focused on the motivations of philanthropic donors to the Olympic movement. So you could say that she laid out the foundation for her future at an early age. Today, in addition to living in Malibu, California with her husband, Andy, and twin daughters, Christine oversees the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic fundraising initiatives. So we look forward to hearing more about you, Christine. Thank you, Mimi, and thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, Mar and Suzanne, wonderful comments, and what a, what a blessing to be here today. Um, thank you for taking the time to learn about the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Foundation. I know it's a mouthful, so we often refer to ourselves as Team USA. Uh, our, uh, our emphasis uh, these days more than ever is on wellness and mindfulness as it's so critical. Uh, those are com critical components for our athletes, as you can imagine. What the American public doesn't know and what we enjoy uh, educating people on is that our U.S. athletes don't receive federal funding. So uh, they rely on the generous support of our um, foundation supporters, donors, uh, our broadcasting partner, NBC, and of course, sponsors. So as we sit and think about mindfulness and wellness and individuality, each one of these athletes takes a plunge when they decide to compete for the United States of America against uh, 205 nations on the world stage. They have to take care of all kinds of aspects of themselves while um, keeping their fingers crossed that the American public uh, decides to back them in a philanthropic way. Our mission at the uh, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, Team USA, is to empower Team USA athletes uh, to achieve sustained competitive, uh, competitive excellence and well-being. So there's the component of 
elite athleticism, right? And being the best in the world or being the best that they can be on that day mixed with well-being on and off the field of play. Um, and Kara will talk a lot more about that um, a bit later. Um, as I mentioned, we don't receive federal funding. We rely on the support of our generous donors. And those donors support things like mental health, sports medicine, uh, obviously nutrition, sports psych, and um, all of the things like we mentioned that sort of uh, create the cogs around an athlete that help them on and off the field of play. So there's plenty of ways to support our mission um, as it relates to, to sound body and mind. And of course, we, we really enjoy bringing people along the way. I'm here in Park City, Utah at the moment because we have our guests arriving in a few days um, to join us for some activities with our alumni athletes. Uh, we can't be in Beijing um, because there's no spectators. Typically, we take our donors as VIPs to the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So speaking of our athletes, our 2022 uh, Winter Olympians, they're 6,000 miles away uh, without friends, family, or fans and they took the plunge. They decided to step on that plane and represent our country, uh, represent sport, wellness, all the things that, that make athleticism so much fun. Um, and, and what they had to do in order to get themselves in that space was they had to trust. Obviously, they had to have an exceptional amount of courage to go to a country that has um, some challenging stipulations around COVID. Uh, basically, they're in a loop where they test in all, they test in and then all day and night they stay in that loop. Um, there's, there's no freedom of speech um, as, as there is in the United States. Um, this also requires the skill set to calm their mind, calm their, uh, their concerns, their fears. Again, many of them are anywhere between the ages of 17, 18, 19 years old, all the way up until their 40s. So um, it is uh, a big, we always think about the, the weight training and the extreme athleticism required. But, but like I said, the amount of um, energy in the, in the space of mindfulness um, and wellness is critical to them competing uh, all around the world. Um, to give you a sense of, of what it takes to be an athlete, if you take a, a woman like Michaela Schifrin, um, you leave in November, uh, you leave the United States in, in early November, and you have about 32 stops on the World Cup tour. Um, and one of those stops happens to be the Olympic Games. So Michaela has been competing all year in Europe. She will then obviously be in Beijing, which is a high, high stress environment. And then she will leave the Beijing Olympics and she will return to the World Cup uh, tour where she'll have approximately 12 more uh, World Cups that she has to achieve until the spring. So just to, that's just a little, a little sense of, um, of what these athletes do. I'm sure you've heard the story of Lindsay Jacob Ellis and Nick Baumgardner there are older, on the older end of our um, athlete population, uh, they are snowboard cross athletes and they just competed for the first time in a mixed team uh, competition and won gold. Both of these athletes have been in the Olympic movement competing um, as elite athletes for, gosh, over 30 years. And the reason I want to focus on them shortly is just that they kept the dream alive, that these are athletes that it could have given up. And time and time again, they've had to calm their mind, calm their body in the start gate, um, compete against four or five other um, athletes. It's sort of like um, motocross, if you will. They all go together in these, these heats of, of snowboard athletes. And they've done this over and over again with the uh, goal of winning a gold medal. And together, a few nights ago, they won gold um, in the mixed teams, which is just a, an awesome accomplishment. I, I'm sure many of you saw Nathan Chen, who won a gold in um, figure skating. And uh, Nathan is also an amazing example of someone who uh, appreciates all the aspects of mind, body, and soul in order to compete at the level that he that he does. And um, I always love to tell the story of um, Aaron Jackson and Brittany Bowe. Uh, this is an extraordinary story. 
Uh, these young women have known each other from the ages of 10 and 14. They've competed together over and over and over again. And they were competing during the Olympic trials in order to uh, qualify for the Olympics in the 500 meter. It's a, a, a long track speed skating event. Uh, the short of it is uh, Aaron Jackson, who is leading uh, the world and, and the sort of ranked first um, in this event, uh, she caught her skate and um, ended up getting third place. In order to qualify for the Olympics, you have to be in the first or second uh, position. All to say her longtime teammate, Erin Jackson, decided to give, uh, sorry, her longtime uh, um, teammate, Brittany, decided to give Erin her spot so that Erin could compete at the games. And so one of the things I just want to emphasize as you watch the Olympics is just remember that these athletes, although they're competing against each other, sometimes on the same team, Team USA or others, they actually get to know each other quite well. They go to each other's homes for the holidays. They travel the world. And this is the diplomacy and the peacemaking uh, aspect of the Olympic and Paralympic movement that we'd love to invite you to join. Um, we have plenty to tell you about. I'm sure I'm running uh, short on time, but there's wonderful ways to be uh, a member of the team behind the team and enjoy and join this international movement. Um, we have events here in uh, North America, all over, and then we also take people to global events. So uh, thank a big thanks to uh, Make It Better and Mimi for having us here today. Um, hopefully when you watch the rest of the Olympics the next few days, you'll think about all the critical aspects that make up an elite athlete, not just their athleticism, um, and know, and please tell your friends and family that they do not receive federal funding and they really do need the support of Americans. The next Olympics, uh, really quickly, are in Paris, 2024. Um, then we go to Italy for the Winter Games, Milan Cortina, and then we show back up here in Los Angeles after 30 years of not being um, on uh, North American soil. Uh, Atlanta, the Atlanta games were our last summer game. So LA 2028, um, we'd love to have everybody get involved and, and thanks to the panelists. Um, I know Cara, Cara, Cara is next and she'll tell you a lot about her experience. She's a four time Olympic javelin athlete and an exceptional example of, of what makes up Team USA. So thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. That gave me the chills, the story about the athlete giving up her spot to her teammate. Um, so as you can see in the chat, we have the donation button here. Um, and please you know, give if you can for these athletes, because as you said, they are putting their hearts and soul into this sport without federal funding. Um, speaking of athletes, our next, our next and final panelist is Kara Winger, four-time Olympian. Um, I, she, there were so many <laughs> things to talk about her. I'm just trying to take the bits and pieces here. She's the American record holder in women's javelin and an eight-time national champion in the event. She comes from Washington and went to Purdue University, where she majored in nutrition, fitness, and health. Um, uh, Kara made her Olympic debut in 2008 um, in Beijing before competing in the Olympic Games in London in 2012, where you, she achieved her record setting throw in the 2010 USA Track and Field Championship. It was a 6.6, wait, 66.67 meter throw, um, which still stands today as a record. And I actually looked that up because I'm not great with meters. Um, so it's 208 feet. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Kara has also competed in the 2015 Pan American Games in Toronto. Um, she earned her first top 15th at the Olympic Games in Rio. And in 2019, Pan American Games in Lima, Peru, um, Kara earned a gold in the javelin. I mean, she's just been around the world having fun doing what she loves. So she served as one of two captains for the U.S. track and field team in Tokyo last summer and was elected by her peers to lead the 2020 U.S. Olympic team into the closing ceremony as a flag bearer. Um, she currently works with Parity, which I'm sure she'll talk about, an online marketplace that matches professional women athletes with social media and marketing opportunities. So with a passion for the outdoors, Kara lives in Colorado Springs with her husband, Russ, and their yellow lab, Maddie. Kara. Thank you, Mimi. Um, I am so happy to be here today. Uh, 
I will correct you actually, 66.67 meters is 218 feet, nine inches. Okay. And that record was actually broken um, in 2021 by okay. uh, Malone, the current like two-time Olympian. Um, Tokyo was her second games and she made the final, which is phenomenal for the sport. Um, this is my final season as an elite javelin thrower. And I'm really you know, excited to keep upping that bar. Um, it's really neat after 11 years of being the American record holder to have somebody on this level. And I'm excited to continue to contribute in this final season. Um, yeah, thrilled to be here. I, as Mimi said, am a four-time Olympian, a five-time world championships team member for Team USA, hoping for number six in Eugene, Oregon this summer, which is only two hours down the road from my hometown of Vancouver, Washington. But um, kind of touching on what Christine was talking about, I have been an Olympic and Paralympic Training Center resident athlete for 12 years, um, going on 13, starting in Chula Vista, California, which is where I am now uh, in 2009, right after graduating from Purdue until 2012, I was here training, living on site. Um, it's not where I met my husband, I met him in college, but we were both resident athletes in Chula Vista and then in Colorado Springs, his hometown actually, starting in 2012. So without that support of the USOPC, without those training facilities, and especially without the sports med medicine facilities, which I'll dive right into in terms of finding my center, I would not still be here today. I wouldn't have made my subsequent three Olympic teams after that first one in Beijing. Um, becoming an Olympian in college still. I was a redshirt junior at Purdue when I made that Beijing team. And then I got to go back to this little bubble of college, this supportive atmosphere that I was familiar with, loved me, knew me, um, had gotten me to the Olympics, and I knew could uh, welcome me back with open arms and help me really hone my craft even more before I went out into the wider world of professional athletics. So I think that the USOPC as this niche athlete, as this tiny little sport, as you know, there's been one woman who's ever medaled at the Olympic games in the javelin. And that was decades ago. Um, she is an absolute inspiration, but uh, fighting an uphill battle kind of in this world of American sport that has such a tradition of success across so many events for me personally, and for a lot of athletes like me in these little known events, that support from the USOPC um, and from the American public is truly, truly important. And I would not have been a javelin thrower for 20 years um, without their support. So some ways that I find my center uh, are have come to light over all of these years of throwing the javelin. I Love the outdoors, but a big part of that is my husband. I met him through sport. We were on a 2006 junior team, development team together in the Dominican Republic and have pretty much been um, in love ever since. Uh, I say it was love at first sight, even though I tried to deny it for a while. He is so interesting. He's so supportive in all ways that I am a human, not just an athlete. And that's really what's become clear to me. Um, as a young athlete, I was always the new kid. We moved around a lot when I was little and I tried all these new sports to make friends. Like I um, didn't know uh, necessarily how to connect with people and did that through movement. So on these teams, I made friends. Um, and I always just enjoyed trying hard. I'm from a fantastic, supportive family that that was always encouraged. Like failure through effort was fine. And if I was having a good time, that was great. So I never really thought too much about the success or failure um, that was happening. I was just enjoying moving and being with my people on the field of play. That kind of continued through to high school when I started javelin for the first time. I truly loved just the people. That's part of what attracted me to Purdue as well, the great teammates that I met when I went on my official visit. And when I got better, when I got to the NCAA stage, um, I remember in 2008, um, I was ranked first going in and I got fifth. In 2009, I was ranked first going in and I got second. Like I never won NCAA championships because I put so much pressure on myself when I got to the biggest stages. 
The same was kind of true of the Olympics when it first started. I made my first team at 22, which isn't young by today's standards, but felt very young at the time. And that overwhelming pressure was too much for me. After those two NCAA championships, I was able to refocus on fun and friendship and family and the people that had really always been there for me to, you know, respectively two weeks later win the Olympic trials in 08 and make the Beijing team and then win the USA national championship in 2009 and make my first world championship team. So really honing in on who I represent, who's on my team, who is absolutely like going to have my back no matter what, instead of representing the United States has always been what helps me find my center in competition. Um, fast forward from there to to some real hardship. Like I mentioned, um, sports medicine has been essential to me with the USOPC. I tore my ACL at Olympic trials in 2012. And I didn't, there was no one in the United States on the women's side who also had the Olympic standard to take my place to go to London. Um, so we fielded a full team of three women, but there was not a fourth who could go to London. So I went anyway. And in the javelin, you sprint, you turn sideways, then you stop on that left leg if you're right-handed, which means it's really difficult to throw super far if you don't have a stable left leg. It was terrifying. I was scared. I didn't know how it was going to go. But what I ended up doing was reaching out to a former Beijing teammate, Bro Greer, the men's American record holder, who actually tore his ACL in 2004 in qualifying in Athens and competed in the final anyway, two days later. So my, my um, reality right then was not as bad as his had been in 2004. And my message there is I'm still reaching out to a person. Like I'm still connecting to a person to find some kind of strength, to find some kind of center. I needed to get even more vulnerable and say, hey, I need help. You're one of the only people in the world who knows what I'm going through. So what do you say? And he wrote me back. This was, you know, at the beginning stages of social media, really. And I was amazed that I got a message in return that said, just do your best. You can do this. Like, I know that you can. I've seen you throw for years and you're going to be OK. So London, even though it wasn't a dream, it turned into a nightmare. Is still one of the most proud performances that I've ever had because I did it. And I got to connect with a person to do it well, to the best of my ability. In the wake of that first ACL surgery, first ACL surgery, I went back to school. That's partially in uh, support of or by the USOPC as well. I went to an MBA program with DeVry University Online on full scholarship via the USOPC, essential support in a time that I was really spiraling. Who am I? I'm injured now. I've had this first surgery and I'm thrilled to explore more areas of my life. So I took up photography. I, we bought a house. We renovated it ourselves. Um, we planned our wedding in that year that we were renovating our house and I was still recovering from ACL surgery. But for me, that is just also outside Colorado is such a, a big part of my life in terms of like being in nature and seeing what the world can be when you really break it down to literally nothing, the mountains and you, and that's about it. So finding my center in other areas with the support of these people that I love um, and of the USOPC, honestly, was really important. I remember when I got in, or accepted into that graduate program, I cried like crazy because I hadn't had something else besides sport in my life for three years. And this freedom to pursue something that was so different and so new um, in a time when I was so broken was extremely important for me. So... In 2020, I, I loved 2020, the summer of it. Um, I know that that's a strange take on COVID, but the freedom to have this summer of nothing after a lot, a lot of years of a lot of things. Plus, um, I knew that Tokyo would be my last Olympic Games, so I was okay to delay the end of my career for another season. Like, I've had this gift of postponement. I know that my body's almost ready to be done being an athlete, but I was really happy to take a second to breathe, to slow down, um, and to really respect and put everything I had into these last two seasons. 
my best friend, Ariana Ince, fellow Olympic javelin thrower, and my roommate in Tokyo 2020, also moved into my house in Colorado in that summer. So once again, I have this person who knows me so well, who has similar goals, but we're very different people, a worthy competitor, an absolute great, great friend, right beside me, pursuing the same goals, but like supporting me in the way that I pursue them as an individual. At the end of that summer, we thought, why not go outside and have another competition, have one competition, see what see what happens, all this work that we've done um, in the lead up to this uh, thankfully postponed and not canceled Olympics. And I tore my ACL again. So August 1st, 2020, within a year of that postponed games, um, having my my best friend there and my husband there to see it was helpful, but it was devastating. Like that 2021 became the hardest year of my life for a lot of different reasons. And um, that really just kickstarted it in the worst way. But um, relying on all the lessons that I've learned through other injuries and really working through the hard stuff with outside time with my dog, um, the support of my husband, when I first talked to him after that second surgery or second injury, I'm sobbing. I'm at my parents' house in Washington. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said to me on the phone, Kara, no matter what, it's going to be okay. And I said, you're right. And I have just gotten to see so clearly over the last year, everything that's happened, the absolutely essential role that people like Russ, like Ari, like my coach of 12 years, Jamie Myers, um, USOPC Strength and Conditioning Coordinator, um, what their presence in my life means to me. It's not just about relying on someone else to get me through something. It's the deep, like absolute heart to heart connection on certain things that get me through the hardest times. And I have some tools that help me find my center on my own as well. Um, I love float therapy. So very similar, you know, idea to some meditation stuff, but I need that extra step of being in this isolated chamber and removing all sensory input. Um, I started that in 2019. And when I truly cannot figure out how to relax, um, which absolutely happened in 2021 and all the stress of healing from another um, ACL injury and I started a full-time job, I was coaching, I was volunteering with USOPC and USATF AAC, um, groups and trying to go to the sports Olympic games, uh, removing all that sensory input and relaxing float therapy is kind of the only way that I know how to do that. But Christine mentioned the, the relationships that happen on teams, the stress of the Olympic games, like the absolute high level, everything that's going on all the time at the Olympics. Um, having been to a COVID Olympics, Tokyo was a lot of things that my first three Olympics were not. And one of the best parts of that was that team coming together. So that absolute through line of me connecting to other people in the midst of my disappointments, I've never made a final at the Olympic Games. I've made two world championship finals, but that's not what, you know, the the headlines focus on. The Olympics are paramount. The Olympics are where all the stress is, is where you absolutely as an athlete want to have your best day. And to have never made a final, even though I know I did everything I could with the circumstances that I had, is a hard pill to swallow as an American. But in the midst of my disappointments, celebrating my teammates' success has always been where I find solace. And Tokyo, that was absolutely true. But everyone coming to this postponed Olympics after we all weren't sure that we would actually make it there was such a powerful feeling of togetherness that extended all the way through that games. And for me to be elected Team USATF captain, by the incredible, diverse, amazing, accomplished women that I respect so much. Um, and then entire Team USA flag bearer for closing ceremonies was the ultimate payoff I never deserved and never thought that I would have after such a career of understanding that the connection to humans through sport is what keeps me grounded. So for them to turn that back on me 
is still something that I can't believe happened. Um, I would have been okay without, but I'm so grateful for uh, in terms of everything I thought I knew about sport, which is that people are wonderful. Um, it's worth all of the hardship. And sometimes finding your center means looking outward um, and respecting the people around you. So those are my lessons. Uh, it's all been so worth it and so amazing. And uh, I'm so grateful to both my teammates and the US USOPC for this incredible 20 years. Kara, that's so inspirational. Amazing. Um, and hopefully you're, you're feeling better with your ACL. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, I just, we have just a couple of minutes for questions. And there was one that we left in the chat here. Um, that was for Suzanne by Susan. Um, what, and actually it was wondering the same thing. What happens in the temples? Um, and I've been to Green Gulch. It's gorgeous. Um, I need to visit the others. What happens for in the temples for the residents and then the non-residents? Um, is there the same access or? Yeah. So, what happens in the temples is different in each temple, right? Because Tassahara is a mountain monastery. So basically during half of the year, uh, the students are cloistered. We're just doing a lot of meditation and, and, and study. But then the other half of the year is what we call guest season. And it's full of workshops and as many as 6,000 to 8,000 people go through the monastery to taking these weekly workshops and what have you. And this is starting in um, April after two years of being closed because of COVID. So that's what's happening there. Green Gulch um, has um, organic intensive agriculture as its main thing, as, as you know, Mimi, you've been there. There's also the meditation, the teachings, the, the learning, but, but there's that activity. And right now, not because of COVID, but usually we have family programs and, and you know, it's open for, for, for general public during the um sunday it used to be city center is a one the poorest one the one that i live in right now um and city center is in in hayes valley in the middle of san francisco so we are starting to reopen now omicron just you know stopped that a bit but usually here we have a lot of activity and residents and non-residents are uh, very much uh in in together in 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 practice so things from um recovery groups to other uh, young urban zen all those groups all those affinity groups um, that that happen here and people also come to meditate they come to meditate to the meditation room so lots of activity here and hopefully reopening now um, after after a couple of years of of being mostly closed Okay, awesome. I have a, a question that got sent to me, and then we'll get to one more of Susan's. But um, considering this is all about the, a fundraiser um, and Christina is working with, I was wondering if you could give us an example of a unique way in which a donor family has been involved and made an impact on Team USA. I loved how you said you're part of the team behind the team. And is yeah. there any good examples so people could relate? Yeah, Kara can attest to this too. Um, we really build a family. And so we have a, a individual family that um, contributed a significant amount of money to our mental health efforts. Uh, this was prior to the Tokyo games where uh, Simone Biles made mental health uh, an important headline. Um, so this individual family was able to uh, fund over four uh, mental health directors at the games. I think it was closer to six and they attended the games um, and were, for the first time in the history of the U.S. movement as it relates to mental health, were able to provide hands-on mental health care for our athletes. Um, we also have a program, a program called Service and Hope, where a family has endowed dollars to provide uh, micro-grants, if you will, to athletes who serve their community after they retire. So it's called Team USA Service and Hope, and we celebrate athletes who go back into their communities um, and make a difference. And that's a $25,000 grant a year. So thanks to that, that family and several others, we've been able to launch the, those two programs. Awesome. Okay, let's try and get one more question for each panelist. Um, Mar, now moving from finance to wellness, that's a, that's a great one. You must have been following your heart. How did you know that you needed to do that and get the courage to do so? 
Uh, in short, you know, it's a feeling. It's one of those feelings that start really, really soft, and then it just gradually increases in intensity. Um, and I waited a little bit too long, but not too, too long. Um, so that that's exactly what I think was the tipping point is that there was a tipping point. And then I started putting my pieces back together. So I think it's, um, I've now learned to listen a little closer. Awesome. Cool. And Kara, I think we're all wondering this. What's next? Well, that full-time job I mentioned is with a company called Parity. Like oh, you that's right. Me yeah. In your introduction, um, I continue to work for them. And it's really nice this year to only have those two full-time jobs, athlete and uh, <laughs> director of integrated influencer marketing is my title. But uh, a lot of stuff. My husband is now a fly fishing guide after retiring from discus throwing in 2016. And that means we spend a lot of time apart. Uh, the dog and I are really excited to follow him around the country and be wherever his jobs are taking him so that I can still work from home um, and be connected to him again. But I hope to be involved in the Olympic movement in some capacity for the rest of my life. Wow. That's awesome. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our time to be respectful for everybody. Um, now, if you remember the way to exit and get to the, uh, the, the tables and booths, as you go back to the homepage, click on a booth, you exit out of the screen, back to the homepage, click on a booth and scroll down to select a table. Uh, thank you everybody so much for your time, especially the panelists. And um, thank you for coming together in this afternoon of inspiration. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye thank guys. You.